Oops. Okay. It looks like uh, it's okay. It looks like it's about that time. I'm gonna get started. I have a a busy morning, and I wanted to get an early start. Thanks, thanks for those of you that could uh, come come live a little bit early. If not, you'll be watching the video record of this, and we're going to start or continue with our um, talking and discussion on different cell types. And if you guys remember, um, I think it was. Thursday we left off on microglia, so we'll, so we'll continue uh, with that. Then I'll tell you a little bit more about peripheral immune cells. Um, so today we'll finish our discussion on microglia and CNS macrophages. Then we'll talk more about neutrophils, lymphocytes, uh, and mast cells. This is where we left off, and I think I've already explained this uh, last week. I just wanted to you know, tell you this is where we left off. Um, but this profile thing, whether you believe it or not, I do think it's important because it does start to allow us to categorize different cells in these different profiles. And I think these profiles or, or a version of profiles do exist, right? And I think where you start to really see that is from something called single cell uh, sequencing. So this is a pretty advanced technique that you can isolate cells of the, of the, you know, anywhere really, but from the brain and spinal cord, you can make single cell suspensions. You can tag these cells with different primer sets. Um, and then you can look at, oh, sorry, this, this is not single cell. This is uh, what's called uh, CYTOF, which is kind of a, a profiling by uh, flow cytometry. The single cell sequencing also is something that really adds to the profiling. Um, but these studies here have really shown differences in microglia, astrocytes, T cells, looking at a lot of different profiles. So you can see these different steady state profiles, these different profiles in aging and in Alzheimer's disease and also sort of in neuroinflammation. And we'll talk more about this when we get into the, to the regulation. This is the single cell seek slide. Um, this is from Beth Stevens' lab. One of her former trainees talked on Monday as part of the Neurological Institute uh, seminar, Dory Schaefer. Um, she gave a great talk, and I know some of you guys were there for that. Uh, but this is Beth Stevens at Harvard, and she did uh, some cell sorting and then single cell sequencing of microglia. She did it at a, at a number of different uh, ages, uh, prenatal, adulthood, and then aged and um, was doing it, I think, even in, in some human uh, lesions. Um, and this is from just her analysis of, of the different profiles of microglia. And so single cell sequencing is looking at, you know, the RNA profile at, at a single cell level. So each of these dots is a single cell and you can cluster them based on their expression profiles. So you can look at known markers of microglia or known RNA species of microglia and then you can look at different ones that change with age or, or time or injury. And we won't go through all these different clusters, but you know, Beth finds nine distinct uh, profiles of microglia. They're influenced by time. And uh, we'll see a, a lot more of this. And in fact, you know, a lot of the papers that we'll do or, or probably discuss, will have some of these techniques in there. But I guess the, the, the take home point from, from me showing you some of that is that Microglia do have specific profiles depending on the context, their age, the time in life. And you'll see that again and again. And I think it's important because we can start to, to put them into categories. You know, are these cells important for repair? Or are they important for interfering with neural homeostasis? So if we want to intervene, like in Alzheimer's or MS, we have to intervene at the right time. And we have to intervene sort of in the right profile, right? If you have a repair profile that's protecting, and neuroprotective, then eliminating them or inhibiting microglia isn't the, the wisest choice. So these profiles are important and, and important to think about. So that CYTOF and single cell RNA sequencing are kind of the hotter, newer ways to do much more advanced profiling of not just microglia, but, but any cell type. So this is a, a slide I want you to, to think about and to know, and certainly questions from the exam will be on here or from here, the activation and regulation of microglia. So, it's not exactly clear how microglia become activated, but, but they can respond to a lot of different things. So they can respond to extracellular ion concentrations like higher levels of potassium, 
uh, calcium, uh, ATP. So it turns out that microglia have a very uh, vast uh, distribution and expression of what are called proteinergic receptors, which combine to ATP. And there's a whole bunch of them. You can identify microglia by their proteinergic receptor expression. So they can respond to levels of ATP. Normally ATP is not floating around, um, you know, extracellularly, but it can, you know, damage or disease. And so that can be a sensing situation for microglia. Microglia, just like other tissue macrophages, are going to be activated by cytokines, the ones that we've talked about before, IL-6, IL-1, TNF-alpha. These drive uh, NF-kappa B signaling, which we'll talk about at some point during uh, one of our lectures. Interferons, that's one um, that's becoming clearer and clearer uh, with more experiments in, in, in CNS infection, but CNS trauma and likely CNS disease and age. Interferons is a is a, is a system that is, you know, ancient sort of inflammatory innate system that activates microglia macrophages. Um, microglia respond to glia neuronal produced cytokines or, and chemokines, and then also can respond to neurotransmitters like high levels of glutamate. So basically, if you look at this list, microglia respond to just about everything. And that makes sense, right? Because they're, they're sensing that local microenvironment. And so any, any change in that homeostasis, the microglia are going to stop and pay attention to that. So, you know, if a neuron's damaged, oligo's damaged, astrocyte isn't performing its function right, it's gonna sense that. So um, we know that the astrocytes are very important. We know that they sort of uh, kind of counterbalance each other. We see that they can modulate their proliferation, extracellular matrix production, cytokine production. And uh, like I said, or hinted at before, I think anytime you see really strong microglia responses in your model, you, the, you're going to see changes as well within that astrocyte population. So there's a direct relationship with neurons, which is different than anywhere else in the body. Um, neurons and microglia have an intimate relationship in the CNS, and neurons seem to really like to keep microglia in check, as you can imagine. It's, they seem to be telling microglia to uh, you know, stay in a surveying homeostatic state. Uh, so there are a number of factors that neurons express on their surface or produce that keep my microglia happy uh, for, for lack of a better term. Ones that you've probably heard about um, would be the, the chemokine fractokine. It binds the fractokine receptor, which is the CX3CLR1 receptor. Uh, that's highly expressed on microglia and fractokine is highly expressed in the brain and produced uh, by neurons. There's also a number of adhesion molecules. So, so one thing we talked about the other day was microglia might scrunch up real small so they can move. Um, it seems like neurons actually kind of keep them in place uh, using things like CD200. Um, there's, there's a few other ones that, that keep them in check as well. We'll go through that in our regulation of inflammation. Um, in terms of activation, uh, most, or maybe some of you know that the innate immune system will use things that are called PAMPs and DAMPs which are pattern associated or pathogen associated molecular patterns or damage associated molecular patterns. Uh, one of the receptors for that are toll-like receptors. Um, they can bind a whole bunch of stuff, viral particles, bacterial particles, changes. So, so it turns out might we have a very high expression of a lot of these toll-like receptors. And again, it just goes into their ability to sense what's happening. They also express a whole plethora of cytokine receptors and scavenger receptors. One that I think you that you know people will label for. Dory Schaefer was labeled for in her lecture on Monday for the, the seminar series for neuroscience, CD68. So that's an intercellular scavenger receptor. Um, and then might we have a number of complement receptors as well. So complement is this ancient innate immune um, system that we'll talk a little bit more about. So perivascular and CNS macrophages, they're outside the brain parenchyma, but they do have macrophage function in these areas. So again, one thing that, that we'll keep trying to hammer home here is that there are CNS macrophages, they're in distinct areas within the brain and uh, you know, they, they're cousins of the microglia, but they don't exactly um, function the same and they're also not in the same location. So um, I'm gonna go through a couple classic papers, uh, I think. Just to show you some of these, some of the cool data that's out there with, with microglia. 
This is a Nimmerjan uh, 2005 paper published in Science. It was really the first to show that, that microglia were actively moving around. And so what they took advantage of is this, um, what it would, you put a transgene or a reporter expression of a fluorescent tag in the microglia uh, fractocon receptor. So, so all the microglia that are fractocon receptor you know, glow green essentially. Then they did uh, thin skull prep and they did two, two photon imaging. So you, they could visualize the microglia moving. And so microglia, for a long time, people thought microglia were static, just staying there. So they're actually seeing the processes move back and forth, all right? And they did things like they're looking to see if they migrate or they moved and that the microglia didn't move their cell body, right? They didn't see proliferation. They just saw this moving. Now, they saw them kind of picking up particulate, you know, so, so they definitely saw the processes in taking things up. So they saw some kind of just uh, regulatory phagocytic action and then what they saw too is if they, they use laser damage, so they damage a blood vessel using a laser, you saw microglia migration. So they actually saw movement of the processes first uh, to that site of injury very quickly. So within, within a few minutes here, you see, see, let me put my thing on highlighter. Um, what is that? That doesn't look like highlighter. Laser point. Um, you can see within, within a minute here, they injure this vessel within, you know, three minutes later, the microglia have moved their processes there. And it looks like, it seems like they're trying to, trying to fix this, this hole uh, within, the, within the vasculature to plug up that hole. Um, so you did definitely saw that. And now with even more studies that people have seen, you know, microglia proliferate with injury. They've seen them move their soma, cell, whole cell body towards there. They've seen it interact with uh, astrocytes. They've seen them pick up debris. So this was a landmark paper just because it showed that microglia weren't static, right? And this, ago, this of course, again, is to, to, to draw your attention if I haven't beat you over the head with it already, is sort of the kind of blood vessels and where the microglia are in the brain parenchyma, right? Versus where the uh, macrophages are. So macrophages kind of get tube like and get stuck in this perivascular space and microglia here are with within the parenchyma. It's very important um, because it's a different spatial location of where they're at and the environment's different too. I have a quick question. Sure. So those um, per, or those uh, perivascular macrophages, those are the ones they will eventually like in damage context migrate into the brain parenchyma, right? Because I see those macrophages, you know, right next to microglia in the same space. It's possible, but it's also possible that these cells would be ones be, being highly involved in recruiting cells. I see. So it, it's possible. These are pretty specialized. They're a little bit different than, you know, your, you know, your circulating monocytes. So we'll get to that, but there's definitely evidence that these guys within, within this space have the ability to break down the blood brain barrier. Microglia don't seem like they have that same profile, right? So you, you would think that um, it would be counterintuitive to have a cell that's, that's lighting the blood brain barrier, trying to protect it like we saw with that laser injury um, that would then try to break it down. But these cells are different. These cells actually express high levels of matrix metalloproteases under inflammatory conditions and help break that down. Obviously, probably help recruit cells. And we'll get into a little bit of that. At some point, we'll get into this sort of microglia macrophage trafficking story. I'm just going, just trying to get your toes wet a little bit each lecture to so keep you thinking about it. Okay, cool. Thanks. Okay. Again, this is this is uh, this is actually a paper from 1988. I don't know if many I don't know if any of you guys are even born then, right? So this is a famous uh, uh, neuroimmunology lab at Dartmouth, published in Science. And if you go look at this paper, you think, how does this ever get into science? <laughs> Just like really just there's two figures this paper. Uh, but what they did was they were able to, to see uh, different populations of microglia and they were able to see a difference in, in difference in you know these microglia lining you know the blood vessels versus these you know squished up paravascular uh, macrophages. And they saw that they were a little bit different. So they saw that these paravascular macrophages were highly MHC class 2 positive or they used an antibody called ED2. 
Um, so they, these guys, you know, had much more of a classic macrophage tissue macrophage profile. These guys are a little bit different. Um, and when they saw, when they induced, um, neuronal injury, they, I think they're using a model of EAE, which is the animal model of MS. Um, they saw that, that when you saw proliferation or sorry, infiltration, you saw monocytes and lymphocytes came into areas that contain these activated, uh, Paravascular macrophages. So, kind of to Isabella's point, you know, these become important areas. And if there is a lot of antigen presentation within the brain, it's probably within these paravascular spaces. Another another big issue uh, that you know is, has come into the forefront over the last maybe decade has been where do microglia come from? Okay. And this is a famous paper. This is uh, from Dr. Janot, who was, I think, was in Thailand for a while. I think he's left there, but had a big lab there. So he was a developmental biologist, not a microglia person per se, but was doing developmental tracing of, of where myeloid cells go. And he had this important discovery that there's this population, these blue cells here, that are myeloid cells, and they're in the embryonic yolk sac. So, I don't know if you can know what the embryonic yolk sac is, but it's the, the sac that surrounds the, the fetus here. And he saw that with time, you know, where did these cells go? They went to the brain. So these, these, these immature myeloid cells from the yolk sac went to the brain. And, you know, since that's the discovery, we know that this embryonic yolk sac um, myeloid population goes a lots of places. So it ends up being the cell type that gives rise to almost all the long-lived tissue macrophages in the body, okay? So they come from a lot of different places. So you think about it, there is, there is there's very little bone marrow at that time, right? So where else will these cells come from? So, um, you know, th this is showing you kind of the, the, the state of age here, embryonic day nine and a half in rodents is when these cells start to come in. Uh, the brain is still taking shape here. Um, you see the microglia start to, to differentiate. The astrocytes start to um, you know, form more of the blood-brain barrier. And uh, we, we see kind of a full representation here of, of microglia differentiation. And this is just showing you, you know, that, that during certain cir circumstances, you get this sort of inflamed response and that you can get recruitment of monocytes. And these monocytes, the recruitment here is from peripheral or bone marrow derived monocytes. Um, this is sort of another representation of that. Um, I believe this was done um, from some single cell sequencing again, looking at different microglia profiles in the uh, em embryonic brain to the neonatal brain to the adult brain. And what you can see is that you know, the microglia start off as sort of an immature myeloid progenitor. And then within the CNS tissue, they start to differentiate. Um, and you can see that with different markers here. Uh, this, this right here, I can tell you, looks a lot, lot like a uh, macrophage with the high CXCR2, high CSF1. Um, and then by... Uh, Adulthood, you see a shift. This is where you're going to see other sort of markers of more mature microglia. They're saying it's MEF2A and CD14. We have a whole slew of them that we've seen sort of change with time and age as well. But the important part here is, you know, this this cycle here is, you know, obviously a cell that's di differentiating and spreading through the brain, populating it. This one is supposed to be involved in pruning. Um, so one thing that happens with microglia development is they eliminate unwanted synapses. This is very important. Um, and this, this is something that they do. This seems to be the synapse pruning profile during development. And then here they're kind of in their, you know, steady state sensing motif. Um, you've seen this before. This is just showing you difference in sort of uh, macrophage recruitment between uh, the brain and spinal cord. This is showing you um, sort of uh, 
CNS perivascular recruitment of macrophages and injury. This was done by Phil Popovich. Um, okay, so along with this, you know, where microglia come from was this idea is, you know, are microglia turned over? And if they are turned over, where do they get turned over from, right? Because there's not really any indication that there's, you know, myeloid progenitors in the brain. All right, there may be, but there hasn't been, no one's ever proved that before. So people have been looking for the source. So if microglia have a lifespan, you know, are they replaced? Now, many of you know that things like oligos and astrocytes are replaced over time in the brain. Things like uh, oligos actually, you know, kind of cycle through quite rapidly versus neurons, which are pretty static, right? Not a, not a lot of, micro, not, a lot of not, not a lot of neuron turnover, although there are some areas where neurogenesis happens. So same sort of questions are with microglia. And there was all these studies where they made bone marrow chimeras. And so what bone marrow chimera is, is if you, this is some wonderful drawings uh, by yours truly, some anatomically correct uh, skull shapes in bone marrow. Uh, this is a femur uh, shapes that are in the middle of the stomach. Um, but what I'm trying to show you here is this is the normal bone marrow. If you irradiate these cells in the bone marrow, you gotta make space. So you gotta either use radiation or use a chemical. You gotta make space in the bone marrow. And then what you can do is you can take uh, a bone marrow transplant essentially, take stem cells from the bone marrow of another mouse. And this mouse happens to have, all their myeloid cells are green. Uh, they're GFP positive, so they have fluorescent green. Now, if you adoptively transfer, so you inject in the tail vein, these uh, stem cells will go into the bone marrow and, and repopulate it. So now you have all your myeloid cells are green within the bone marrow. Uh, you wait three or four weeks and then you can do something, we can injure them. So in these studies, people had done Alzheimer's disease, ALS, facial axonomy. Um, and they found that you not only did you see uh, microglia being, or monocytes being recruited to the brain, you also saw them become uh, what looked like to be microglia. But there's a sort of confound of radiation. So when you irradiate somebody and you don't protect the skull, you can get a lot of vascular damage. And so one of the confounds with this idea was that, well, you're damaging the blood brain barrier. So one of the experiments that uh, uh, Joseph Priller and his lab did, um, and uh, Marco Prince, two really famous German neurologists, um, continue to do amazing work still. Uh, what they did was the same experiment, but they protected the, they used radiation to, to clear the bone marrow. This little blue helmet is my sort of shield. Um, and they did it unshielded and shielded. And they look for whether or not they had a uh, turnover of microglia. And they found again that in the unprotected mice that you saw this turnover from monocytes, but in the ones you protected with the helmet, you know, the lead helmet, that you didn't get any microglia turnover from the bone marrow. So this is sort of a very, this Milner experiment was very famous, uh, showing that it doesn't seem to be a lot of turnover of microglia, even in these really highly inflammatory conditions, if you, you, take, you take away the confound of um, radiation. Uh, here's another way that they kind of showed this. This is another paper. This is a JAMI. Uh, 2007, they did what's called peribiosis. Anyone know what that is? Isn't it where you like connect the two animals so that their blood flow is flowing through both? Yeah, yeah so you, you uh, it's the sort of mesentery blood supply. You bind them together and they'll sort of grow, they'll share a blood bloodstream. And so you pair a a GFP chimera mouse to a regular mouse, and you do all these things. So you don't have to worry about, you, you do it to this mouse here, right? And then you look to see if there's green cells in the brain and uh, you didn't, you know, they did the same things and it didn't happen. Um, so they argue for um, self-renewal, meaning the microglia probably come from a population within the CNS. Um, one thing that was, it was part of, of some of these studies um, that, that, that they looked at was you could tell based on these studies if the microglia were turned over or not. 
And subsequently from this, you can see that a microglia is, is not turned over very often. Um, it seems to have a very low turnover. So, you know, a, a mouse microglia survives for years and a mouse only lives for years, right? So uh, it turns out that the very limited turnover of microglia and it, and it looks like they turn over, you know, in the cortex, like one or two times over the lifespan. So if you think about that, if you have an early life perturbation, whether it's injury or disease or you know, something seen as infection, if something permanently changes that microglia's function, chances of it being turned over is low, right? So that's why we really worry about CNS changes in early life uh, infections and early life inflammation, because if you're not turning over the microglia and they're more of a you know, static permanent population, then whatever changes are occurring during that time may stay. Okay, so also getting into the turnover idea um, was really this landmark paper by Kim Green's lab in, uh, I think it's 2014. Monica Elmore was the uh, first author, really highly cited paper. And what they got was a chemical that many of you probably have tried to use or, or would like to use now made famous and everybody and their cousin now likes to use it, but they got a, they got a, a company from a, from a, they got a product from a drug company that was a C kit um, inhibitor. And they were actually using it in the context of cancer chemotherapy. And Kim Green, they gave it to him. Uh, the company was called Plexcon. And he was looking for, he was looking for if he could use this drug to limit, um, Alzheimer's pathology. But when he used it, he found something very interesting on just the normal microglia. So it turns out that the microglia need the colony signaling factor receptor um, to bind colony signaling factor to survive. And what this thing is, is a colony signaling factor receptor antagonist. So it blocks this interaction um, and it blocks, you know, this, the C kit, um, activation. And when you give it to the, to the animal, all the microglia go away. Okay. So you feed this um, compound to a mouse and you find that, you know, within, look at this, within three days, microglia significantly go away. And by 21 days on this compound, you really find no microglia. This is, this is the histology they did. Um, you can see all these brown dots are microglia and by uh, you know, 21 days, you really see no brown dots. This is a, a IBA1, which is a microglia profile, um, kind of standard antibody you can use for IHC. You can see that over time, the microglia go away. And really this was, this was profound. I mean, when, when he prevent, presented this, uh, people were basically throwing like rotten fruit at him at, uh, one of the, I was at a SFN conference, probably 2000 people in the audience packed room and people were like, that's impossible, right? Um, and people were screaming, oh, if you take away the microglia, the animals will die or something bad will happen. But the crazy part was you could take away all the microglia and had no effect on any behavior, any locomotion, any neurotransmission, anything uh, that, that they looked for. Um, so the other really amazing part of this is that if you take the drug away, so let's say you have the mice on the drug for, for 21 days. I don't even do it. They did it only seven days. You have it on for seven days and you get rid of all the microglia and then you take them off the drug, the microglia come back and they come back very quickly. Within a day or so, you start to see these microglia repopulating. So, and then within, I don't know, certainly by seven days, you find that most of the microglia have come back. So again, this argues, you know, what the Ajami was saying in sort of the self renewal. Somehow these microglia, and it, you know, people have been working on this, that the microglia come back. Plexicon, the colony signaling factor receptor antagonist, eliminates about 97%, depending on the mouse strain. So that three to 5% that that, that persists with the drug 
um, they're the ones that divide and give rise to all the rest of them. And it doesn't, again, seem to be a confound of macrophages coming in. Now, if you were to inhibit the microglia from the ability to proliferate uh, in sort of a last ditch effort to repopulate the brain, you would then see uh, monocytes coming in and repopulating. So it is possible to get a whole monocyte repopulation from the periphery, but it's not common. And you have to do some weird stuff to get that to work. And then when those monocytes are in the brain, they don't really ever become microglia. They don't have the same exact functions, but it's close enough, uh, I guess, that the animal can adapt to that. Okay, so a major uh, take home points, microglia and cis macrophage are distinct and separate cell types. Both are myeloid derived and can perform similar roles within the CNS. Uh, microglia are from these myeloid uh, origin, but are not turned over from, you know, normally turned over low limit, limit, limited turnover rate and really aren't coming from bone marrow derived monocytes. Uh, a myeloid progenitor cell within the CNS may allow for microglia turnover um, or may just be the microglia turn proliferation from the remaining mice or remaining microglia, if that's clear. So it looks like uh, microglia turnover is pretty rare occurrence and people have actually done this using a, a carbon 14 labeling in the brain to show that in, in humans, microglia turnover is, is very low as well. Um, you know, one of the questions you can have, this is uh, some, just showing you again, the Plexicon diet versus the vehicle control. Plexicon again is the calming semi factor receptor antagonist. This little stick drawing just shows you that as you have the, the mice on it, they, they go away. And then, you know, within uh, a day or two, they repopulate. Becomes a very interesting question though, is that let's say you do this in the context of injury or disease. Does this microglia come back as it was? Does it come back as a disease microglia or does it come back as a new one? You know, really interesting question, right? And so it turns out that, you know, a lot of people have thought of this question. And so you see a lot of papers where people have been doing this, you know, injury or disease and then take the microglia away at a certain time point and then want to repopulate and then look at, at their profiles. And it depends on the context. Sometimes you can see a big improvement um, in the profiles of the microglia by depopulating them and repopulating, and sometimes you don't. So a good example was a paper that we did in age mice, um, and we found that uh, you couldn't, uh, you could force the turnover of microglia, but you still got an age profile. And we assumed it was from the fact that the microglia are coming back in an environment where they are, um, you know, where there's reactive astrocytes and other things. Um, and then in some other mice, you know, you see that replacement of microglia, you know, is neuroprotective or protects them from cognitive decline or, or you know, reverses microglia priming. So this is a strategy that you're likely to see in some of your um, discussion papers and one that might be a good topic, again, for uh, your papers about this idea of, of trying to repopulate microglia. Um, this is uh, just showing you a little bit of intercellular tolls. This is something that's important on microglia. Intercellular tolls, or sorry, toll-like receptors are both extracellular, intercellular, meaning they're on the surface or they're inside the cell. Uh, they can find, they can form heterodimers or homodimers. Um, neurons, you can see, have some. They can sense some things are going on. And all of these here are intercellular. And the reason that's important is that we know neurons can respond to viral and viral responses. And so all of these here bind intercellular uh, sections of, of viral particles to, to let the body know that there's an infection. So that makes sense. But neurons don't really have the full complement or the full array of toll-like receptors. Now you can find a, a bunch of toll-like receptors, um, the intercellular one, toll, toll 7, and a bunch of the extracellular ones, um, toll 1, 2, 4, and 6 on astrocytes. So astrocytes have some capacity to respond to sort of the innate immune um, activation profiles. And then really what I was trying to show here is that the microglia have a whole array of them. All right. Again, just, just more proof that, that really the cell is going to be responding. The majority of the signals is the microglia, although other cells certainly have some capacity to do that.
We're going to get into more of this as we move forward, but I think what we want to start to do is I've told you about a bunch of cell types, um, and now we want to think about how they interact, and that's really going to be key, and that's going to be what we're going to have a whole set of lectures on. Um, but the idea is, you know, if it kind of starts with the astrocytes being a support cell for neurons, keeping neurons happy, also trying to keep microglia happy, producing things like glial growth factors and, and neurotrophic factors like brain-derived neuro neurotrophic factor and anti-inflammatory kind of molecules to keep the system in check. Um, and then we can see things with, with activation that, you know, there's going to be this interplay between microglia and astrocytes. Also, the microglia producing reactive mediators, cytokines, prostaglandins, reactive oxygen species are going to affect the neurons, going to affect the astrocytes. Um, and then there's this balance here where the astrocytes try to do things like use anti-inflammatory uh, cytokines to shut off the microglia. So this this pretty big interplay between these these three cell types in the context of, of uh, responses. And then the neurons also uh, will come back and try to, to regulate the microglia using fractokine, um, regulating them using CD200 and CD22 interactions, uh, and then also micro or damaged neurons can activate microglia. So this is this kind of full circle of these positive and negative feedback loops, and we'll talk more about this. Um, within the brain, there's a balance, and I think it's important to know that we always want to maintain an anti-inflammatory balance. That's our kind of go-to uh, thermostatic set point is to be, you know, pushing more growth, survival, and anti-inflammation. So we see things like we want fractokine to be high, CD200 to be high. We'll see IL-1 receptor antagonist, cytokines that are anti-inflammatory like IL-4, IL-10, IL-12. Some of these actually might come from uh, peripheral cells like T cells. Transforming growth factor, insulin growth factor, all things that keep keep things calm, um, and we try to make, balance that because when we see other things um, that drive in the other direction, like reactive oxygen species, prostaglandins, cytokines like TNF alpha, IL one, interferon, gamma, uh, chemokines, sort of push push the balance more towards inflammation. Okay. So I think I've told you quite a bit about uh, microglia, enough really to, to think about and, and hopefully enough that we can continue to build on that. Um, what we'd like to talk about here, sorry, is, is some of these other cells. These are peripheral immune cells. Uh, in the blood, we'll have things called natural killer cells, neutrophils, and monocytes. The monocyte uh, and neutrophil come from what are called myelin progenitors, uh, which are similar, you know, same, Cousins of the microglia, uh, natural killer cells come from lymphoid progenitors. Um, and then you have these lymphoid progenitors that become uh, T cells. So T cells start in the bone marrow and go to the thymus. That's what are called T cells. There's many different classes of T cells. These are sort of the two classic ones, the helper T cells, the CD4 positive cells, and the cytotoxic T cells or the CD8 cells. And then there's only a few types that can present antigen, and we'll talk about that. Uh, macrophages, dendritic cells, and then B cells. You know, and I think it's important, you know, to, 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 to highlight this again, is you don't really find, you know, natural killer cells in the brain or monocytes. You know, we find mostly kind of an innate capacity, we find astrocytes and microglia, and also, you know, I've talked about this, that we do see mast cells, dendritic cells, and macrophages in the brain, brain, but they are really in low number and they're in specialized area. Low number compared to all the other cell types of the brain, right? So you do see them, you can't find them, and they are important, but there's just not a lot of them. And they're not really, they're in, they're in areas that are not really considered being permanent residents of the brain. They're kind of in that just visiting profile. And again, these would be the adaptive ones. These would be more of that second arm of the immune system. Uh, again, the only resident uh, CNS cell type that can present antigen or microglia, at least present antigen to a T cell uh, would be, be microglia. 
The other ones that are low populations that are shared here would be dendritic cells and macrophages, whereas we don't really see any resident populations of cytotoxic T cells, regulatory T cells, CD4 cells, B cells, or plasma cells. So this is going to be unique. And again, this kind of ties into some of the idea of privilege that you really don't have that adaptive arm of the immune system within the brain and spinal cord. So one of the first important cells to kind of talk about in terms of peripheral responses are neutrophils. So these come from the bone marrow. They uh, are granulated cells. They're really called the first line of defense. They're the ones that are actively, actively recruited to sites of injury. Think about you know, our skateboarding example where you're, you know, cut your knee up. You know, those, the neutrophils are gonna be the first ones to that site of inflammation. They're there to try to, to clean up debris and also just dump a number of uh, agents within that area to kind of purify it. Um, and you'll see neutrophils as being the first cell that comes into brain injury or spinal cord injury as well. They're a pretty high number uh, within the blood, you know, about 40 to 75% of leukocytes are neutrophils. They're from myelin progenitors. Um, they are circul in circulating in the blood. They're, you know, within the blood, if you look at the number of red blood cells, there's not gonna be very many neutrophils, okay? So kind of a low population unless less they're needed. Um, they have a unique structure, so you can kind of see they're, they're granulated here. So you can kind of detect them just with H&E staining. Uh, but there's a number of antibodies you can use uh, to detect a neutrophil and, and they're listed here. Um, I wouldn't ask you how to detect a neutrophil. Okay, so how are they important? Um, so they're really important in immune surveillance and they're in the blood. They're gonna be the first responders to a lot of things. Um, they have this you know, unique shape or unique uh, nuclear shape and they're granulated. They have really strong antimicrobial functions. You're gonna see them come into a site of, of, of damage or infection, and then uh, basically uh, use all up their energy and, and go crazy, essentially. They, they will start dumping things. They'll be very active in recruiting other cells. So they're the first ones there, kind of like the uh, paramedic, right? And they, they call everybody else to come in. Um, they have this respiratory burst, um, which is sort of energy driven. And you're gonna see this a number of inflammatory and secretory products that are released. Um, you can also see them pick things up, degrade things, and they're very high in things called lys lysozyme and myeloperoxidase. Um, and these are really, again, antimicrobial. So you wanna, you know, you, if a neutrophil comes to the wound site, it wants to clean the wound site and, it'll, and, and, and purify it. And that's what it does. And I think they're important for neurology because you definitely see them uh, early in injury. And uh, a recent paper by Andrew Sass, who's a professor, assistant professor here at OSU, um, showed that there's different types of neutrophils and seem, seem to be some you know, neutrophils that, that come into an injured area that are highly toxic uh, and cause a lot of collateral damage within the CNS, but there's also ones that might be more reparative. So again, more uh, distinction of the different populations. Okay, so neutrophils make myeloperoxidase, a uh, very high, you know, oxidative compound. Um, it's going to oxidize things. It's basically equivalent to household beach, bleach. So, you know, think about purifying something, use bleach. Uh, lysozyme is going to be antimicrobial as well. Uh, elastase, because uh, pesins, neuroproteases, Collagenase is going to break down tissue, superoxide. It's going to make highly reactive, uh, reactive oxygen species. Leukotrienes are going to be chemoattraction, nitric oxide. So they come into the wound site and release all these factors in, in sort of a giant um, ball of fire. Um, and, and for peripheral tissue, this is fine. Collateral damage caused by that is you know, mostly repairable in the brain. Um, not so much, right? So that's one worry about the neutrophil in damage areas is the high level of collateral damage that happens. Um, and I think that this is really what, what this is showing you here. Um, they have this respiratory burst, they're involved in cleanup, um, but we have this sort of side effect of collateral damage 
Um, we know that once they come in, blood-brain barrier permeability decreases and more things come in. Um, this is a paper, very old now, but you know, people started doing things like knocking out certain chemokine receptors or chemokines, and you could find that you could reduce uh, neutrophil recruitment. And actually, I think Phil Popovich showed this in spinal cord injury, that if you limited neutrophil um, infiltration early in the spinal cord injury, it was beneficial. Uh, you didn't have as much collateral damage, as much, much inflammation. We'll talk about this more, but you know, in order to get a cell into tissue, and it doesn't really matter what tissue you're talking about, the brain has that extra step of, of that paravascular space and the glial limitin, but anytime you want to get cells into tissue, remember cells are floating or going through the bloodstream, so you have to slow their speed. So there's a number of, of molecules involved in slowing them down. Um, and then uh, these are called selectins, slows this neutrophil down. Um, and then there's adhesions that tightly adhere it. And then you'll see it kind of go between, um, you know, the, 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 the two endothelial cells and come in and sense what's happening. So a lot of times they move based on a, a chemokine gradient. The chemokine that's important for neutrophils is this uh, CX, uh, CL8 and I'll track neutrophils. Um, the other one, human equivalent is IL-8 if you've ever heard of that before, um, but they'll go into an area based on the chemo attractant gradient. So um, when these neutrophils come into CNS, it's, it's, it's slower than what when it'd be if it went into peripheral tissue. And anyone wanna take a guess why? The glue limiting, right? So there's just more, it's just, it's harder to get through. You've seen this slide before, just keep in mind that what the neutrophil infiltration might look like in the brain and spinal cord might be a little bit different. Um, it looks like neutrophils get in a little easier to the spinal cord than they do to the brain. You can see them kind of getting captured here in the paravascular or the vacno robbins space. How are we doing on time? Ooh, I think I'm already. No, I'm not. I'm not on an hour yet. Okay, good. I thought I started at eight. Okay. Um, mast cells. So mast cells are another um, specialized myeloid cell. Um, any of you guys have allergies? The mast cell is going to be really important for that. Um, they are these granulated cells, and then when they get activated, they degranulate. So you can see all these little vessels here, and when they degranulate. Uh, they release a lot of, one, one of the major things they produce is histamine. Um, and they also involved in, in sort of allergy responses. So people that have allergies oftentimes have high mast cell reactivity. Um, and there's a lot of interesting stuff with mast cells. So mast cells are de detected in the brain. And, and some of you may know, I think maybe some of you work for Katie Lenz, know that you know, mast cells are there early in development. And uh, I think more so than they are in the adult brain and, and seem to have a role in, in brain development uh, by producing histamine. Um, I think they can also produce like a serotonin uh, biomar, a bioavailable serotonin. I think it might actually be serotonin if it's not uh, a serotonin-like molecule. So there's also evidence that's involved in, in CNS disease. So in this paper it talks about it being involved in MS. The mast cells can you know, be involved in leukocyte recruitment. They can make cytokines and they can release things like histamine. Okay, so they do a lot of things. Um, when they degranulate, um, and this is showing you how they do degranulate, um, it can be through a special uh, IgG or IgE uh, response. So it can bind to antibodies and get released, or it can just release uh, based on activation. Um, it's gonna produce a lot of chemo attraction things to bring in more neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils. It's going to use histamine, and what histamine does is it's a, 
it's an, an increase in, in vasodilation and permeability. Um, and then you're going to see a lot of things in, involved in, in um, recruiting other cells and a bunch of enzymes, um, a bunch of enzymes that are going to, you know, hopefully degrade any sort of, uh, of uh, pathogen. It makes prostaglandins, leukotrienes, um, and reactive oxygen species. So again, another really highly inflammatory cell that's pretty nonspecific. And, and like I said, it does make histamine and it also makes serotonin. So it makes serotonin, which I think the interaction between histamine and serotonin is why it's thought to be important in brain development. So uh, mast cells in the context of neuroinflammation are going to alter blood flow. They're going to increase blood brain barrier permeability. So more things can come in. They can stimulate angiogenesis. Anyone know what that is? Blood vessel formation. Yes, thank you. So not everyone's sleeping, thank you. Um, the, it's also uh, gonna affect neurotransmission. And, and we think that things like mast cells can contribute to demyelination and MS and potentially uh, generate uh, more uh, of the alternative cleavage protein that, that kind of um, accumulates in Alzheimer's disease. So a lot of different potential negative roles of mast cells. And again, it, it's mostly tied to their innate function where they have a, a rather nonspecific response that has a lot of collateral damage. So T cells, now this cell is, is one that we haven't really talked uh, about at all, but very important for immunity and particularly the adaptive immunity. And T cell comes from the bone marrow, uh, but matures in the thymus. Um, they're mostly gonna be protecting against pathogens. They, uh, there's a number of different ones and the reason, the, the way that you can identify them, at least kind of on a molecular way, is uh, the proteins that they express on the surface. So you have the CD4 positive, that's a cluster of differentiation four versus a cluster of differentiation eight. And the CDs basically are all immune uh, denotations. The CD4 cell is that helper cell and the CD8 is the uh, cytotoxic. Um, T cells are gonna do a lot of things. They, they help uh, activate macrophages and they help activate B cells. They represent about 20 to 30, 20 to 50% of all the leukocytes. They come from a hemopoietic stem cell, uh, which is a lymphoid progenitor. They start in the bone marrow, they mature in the thymus, that's where they get their name. And you find um, T cells really highly expressed, um, not, not necessarily in the blood. If you have high you know, T cells, white blood cells in, the, in, in your blood, that usually means there's some sort of infection or cancer or something else. They're usually ha hanging out in the secondary lymphoid tissues, which are the lymph nodes uh, within the spleen, uh, the GALT, which is the gut associated lymphoid tissue, um, thymus, you know, so you find them mostly, honestly, mostly within the lymph nodes. So they are, you know, a lot of different cell surface markers that can be used to detect them. Um, one of the main ones is uh, CD3 is going to, to represent all T cells. Um, then there's a T cell receptor that you can tell. And then, um, you know, you'll see that they're either CD8 or CD4 uh, positive. Okay. So I think it's important to know the T cells and what they're involved in. So normally they're, they're also involved in immune surveillance. They're within those secondary lymphoid organs, the spleen, the gallt. Um, they also come in, come in and out of the CNS. They come in through the quarry plexus and they kind of travel through the, the CSF and come back out to the newly identified lymphoid uh, 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 organs there within the brain, the lymphatic system of the brain. We know they're involved in the immune surveillance of the lymph nodes. They uh, involve sort of inflammatory modulation. Um, they increase the adhesion molecule expression and they have these different effector functions. So um, there's different type of immune responses and they're usually labeled like this, Th1, Th2, Th17. So a Th1 is gonna be more of a macrophage driven response. A Th2 is gonna be more of an antibody B cell response and a TH17 is, is more of a specific kind of inflammatory T cell response. 
Um, let's see. T cells are involved in memory. There are memory T cells, so they'll kind of uh, uh, exist after an inflammatory event, you the development of memory T cells. Um, one area that we see them in the context of neuroimmunology is that T cells are going to be important for any autoimmune reaction. So MS, which is thought to be a uh, autoimmune a disease against some of the myelin uh, proteins within oligos, uh, is going to be T cell mediated. We also see T cells are recruited uh, and detected in CNS injury. Um, and we also know T cells as they're, they're coming in and out of the brain and hanging out in the meninges, that they actually signal across there and, and communicate to the brain. So there's a guy, uh, Yoni Kipnis, who's at WashU now, done a lot of work with T cells in communicating, you know, T cells communicating in health and disease with neurons and microglia and astrocytes. So uh, T cells are, seem to be very important in some of these things. This is a this is a very old uh, slide. I think this might have been from, well, maybe my college uh, immunology textbook, uh, but it's showing you the different types of antigen presentation and T cell responses. And so, um, this is going to be, I believe, the kind of cloudy looking cell here is going to be an antigen presenting cell, likely a dendritic cell, and this is where T cells kind of interact with them through the uh, what it, this right here is MHC class two. Um, it's interacting with an antigen presentation, and presenting cell, and you can get this activated T cell. So we'll go through antigen presentation in, in more detail, but what the slide goes to tell you is that you really need very specific responses uh, to get this activated T cell. Um, if you don't, if like, for example, uh, you have if this is a self protein, you actually get destruction of that T cell. You're supposed to get destruction of T cell. You can also get um, inhibition where it suppresses T cells. Um, and then you can also have this, this regulatory T cell that can suppress activation. And what they're trying to show you too is that um, with this anatomical barrier, you know, a lot of times you're not going to get a T cell reaction, right? So that happens a lot with the, within the brain parenchyma. If you had a microglia in the parenchyma, it's presenting antigen potentially. There just might be anatomical barriers to that T cell ever seeing that antigen. Okay. So we know that lymphocytes can cross a blood brain barrier in the absence of pathology. If you're going to find, sometimes you can find them within the perivascular space as well. These can be activated or memory lymphocytes. We know that their entry is regulated by adhesion molecules um, using T cell specific ones, but also just generalized VCAM and ICAM. They respond to chemokines. These are the CC chemokines, um, MIP1, RANTES, IP10, lymphotactin are some of them. You know, again, you're gonna see different chemokines and you're gonna see different things as you read more about neurominology that attract T cells. They're going to respond to macrophage microglia derived cytokines like IL-1, TGF-beta, IL-6, and this TH1 versus TH2 cytokine profiles define their, their effective function. So this is a little bit about T cell development. Uh, immature thymocytes here start out, um, you know, this is within the thymus, they're, they're CD3 positive, CD8 positive, CD4. Um, and within this uh, maturation within the thymus, there's this dendritic cell, a negative selection. So this dendritic cell will challenge these T cells with self antigen. And the idea is that you eliminate any T cells that sort of react against self. And this is a process that happens during um, you know, their development. Then you get this a differentiation uh, of a CD8 T cell or a CD4. These are naive. What naive means is they've never seen you know, antigen outside of the thymus. Uh, then they're released. Um, and these, these cells are the ones that become the cytotoxic T cells, the CD8s. And the CD4s are the helper cells. And they're sort of within the TH1 or TH2 helper. And again, these guys, you can find these guys within the lymph nodes. This is antigen presentation, and this is showing you uh, TH1 versus TH2. You will have to know this, and we will talk about it more, but just to highlight again uh, what's important, if you have an act, 
an activated macrophage here or you have a ma macrophage that picks up antigen and it breaks it down, it's going to uh, present some of that on the surface. And then you have your Th1 cell, you have the, the uh, T cell receptor, and then you need a bunch of cofactors. Um, and then this T cell is gonna use an interferon gamma to activate macrophages. Um, so this is a Th1, this is gonna be a pretty inflammatory response. This here would be what, what's happening um, with um, the COVID vaccine, where you're gonna have the spike protein presented on MHC class two by a B cell. And then this T helper cell, the Th2 cell is going to turn the B cell on, turn it into a plasma cell to produce antibody against that, that spike protein. So these are just, just showing you how T cells help. Um, this is showing you the, the sort of the antibody production again. We'll go, we'll go more into this. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. The Th1 versus Th2 story is a lot like, um, you know, the M1, M2 idea with macrophages. Actually, those ideas come from Th1, Th2. And what it is, is Th1 is involved in cell-mediated immunity. It's gonna be things that we, we use to target intercellular pathogens. Th1 is also gonna be the response that's involved in autoimmunity like MS. And a Th1 response is gonna be macrophage-driven. So you're gonna see a lot of the macrophage-driven cytokines like IL-1, TNF-alpha, IL-12. Um, and you're gonna see a lot of, of this sort of profile from the T cell making interferon gamma, TNF-alpha, IL-10, and IL-2. Uh, this process is, is, can be regulated by something called a T regulatory cell, and there's a balance. Um, and then a TH2 response is, is going to be driven mostly by IL-4 and IL-6, and they're going to drive things like um, T cells to make IL-4, IL-10, 13, and 15. And these responses, again, are important for antibody production, extracellular pathogen responses, hemolysis, vaccination, and allergy. So when you think about Th1 versus Th2, and we'll, again, we'll talk more about this. This is really what we're talking about. This is to make it way, way more complicated for you, just showing you the interaction. Um, most of the responses are all going on at the exact same time. So that what they have to depend on is sort of the balance. Um, you don't have just a Th1 response. You don't have just a Th2. They're kind of going on simultaneously, but they'll ship they'll shift over depending on the immune system is very smart. And so if you're looking really to, to make more antibodies, the, the things that activate the Th2 response shut down the Th1. Um, and there's also, I threw in the Th17 response, which is also thought to be important in autoimmune disease in highly inflammatory conditions where you drive a, a high uh, Th17 um, pro-inflammatory profile with IL-17, IL-26, and others. And again, this slide is probably overdone. I'm not going to ask you things from this slide, but it's just showing you the complexity of the immune system, if you weren't already uh, feeling that before. So where do we see, uh, you know, lymphocytes and in, neuroinflammation? Um, you know, I think they have both direct and indirect uh, pathology in a lot of demyelinating conditions. We know that, you know, in demyelinating conditions, you can have a lot of uh, self-reactive antibodies. We also know that you can see that T cell cytokines can, can disrupt oligodendrocytes. We know that the CD8 cytotoxic lymph lymphocytes can kill neurons and glia. So if you think about a CNS infection, if you're if, you're, you have, if you get a lot of cytotoxic T cells that get into the brain, they're going to kill a lot of cells and there's gonna be a lot of damage. Um, let's see, I know when the, the, you know, see the cytokine production by T cells can alter the, you know, the electrophysiology properties of neurons and axons. Um, and also there's a balance where T cells are involved not only in inflammation, but also seem to be important for just uh, normal responses. How many slides do I have left? All right, let me just finish. Ooh, ooh, front row. Let me finish. Only a few more slides. I know I'm a little bit over time. Oh, okay. um, 
This is MHC class one presentation, and you can kind of see on my slides if you want to look for it closely that MHC class one only has one transmembrane protein, just a little bit of a, of a key off for you. Um, what MHC one is for is for uh, self antigens. So normally this would be self protein. Here we're showing a antigen presenting cell that has a virus inside of it. So let's say this is COVID-19. The cell presented on MHC class one and the T cell, the cytotoxic T cell will recognize it as non-self. This is going to activate that cytotoxic T cell. It's going to make IL-2, which is gonna make these T cells expand. And they're gonna be, they're gonna expand to be very specific against this specific protein. Then they're gonna, they're called armed. So this CD8 cell will flop around the body uh, looking for any cell that's infected with this particular virus and it'll destroy it. All right, so armed T cells will kill cells. And this is great for limiting the spread of infection. So this is one of the classic things that our immune system does. Not so great though, if, you're, if what's infected is a neuron, right? And then it uses things like TNF alpha and fast ligand to destroy that cell. And then you have these apoptotic bodies. One kind of cool thing about microglia is that you can see these phagocytic microglia picking up the debris and they do this without causing mass tissue destruction. Um, so the microglia seem to be specialized to be able to pick up apoptotic bodies of, of, of formerly virally infected cells with, without collateral damage, which is unique and important. So microglia are doing a nice cleanup job here without causing a lot of problems. Um, this is an example just to show you of, of why the peripheral immune system is important to think about in disease. This has been an example of, of MS and MS is the, this beautiful uh, neuron drawing by me shows you the myelination of an axon and it shows you in the course of, of uh, MS. So again, this is a loss of, of myelination here. Um, you see that over the course of this, what's happening is you are presenting self antigen. So this is gonna be myelin basic protein presented uh, by an antigen presenting either microglia or macrophage. It's going to present to a T cell likely within the paravascular space to start with. Then this is going to recruit more cells, all right? So now you have T cells that are coming in, getting activated, uh, producing cytokines, bringing more cells in, and then you can have oligos damage directly by that inflammation. And you can also have direct antibody damage um, against those cells. And we'll talk more about this. Okay, to review, I think something that's very important is that the most of what we talked about in terms of innate immunity within the brain is mediated by the microglia. Um, and these are really the only resident immune cells, truly resident immune cells in the parenchyma. Oops and that the visiting cells you know, represent a lot of peripheral ones. We know that there are surveying T cells involved in, in Th1 and Th2 responses. We have these specialized macrophages in areas like the paravascular space, the meninges, the choroid plexus. Uh, and then we also see kind of these low numbers of visiting granulocytes, mast cells, and neutrophils, and then uh, areas where we see some, some dendritic cells. And with that, with these past two lectures, I hope I've given you enough information to be dangerous about the different cell types that we will definitely see um, throughout the course of the class. So I will um, stop the recording, hopefully. <laughs>